Good morning. Good morning and a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, I'm Elir Miteza, Associate Provost for Graduate Global and Digital Education. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many of you here uh, on this historic day for U of M Dearborn, the inauguration of Chancellor Grasso. Uh, to, open this, uh, to open up this research showcase, I would like to invite to the podium uh, our Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, Dr. Kate Davey. Good morning. It's wonderful to see so many of you uh, here today. The theme for today's inaugural celebration is the legacy of excellence, a future of promise. And what we just witnessed, the um, presentations out in the other room of the research of our faculty and students is a testament to the legacy of excellence as well as the uh, future of promise. So what you were seeing in those presentations are collaborations among faculty and students on robust research projects that students are engaged in. We have a relatively new program called SURE and it's student uh, summer undergraduate research experience for students that matches faculty with students. But in addition to the 26 or so of those students, engineering has many, many students working with faculty on research, and so does mathematics, among other disciplines on the campus. This is a chance for our students to learn new methodologies and to apply their knowledge in real world uh, situations. As you saw out there with the research project on the environment, for example. And you have to be impressed with the race car. Uh, the <laughs> and that particular race car hasn't won a race, but our students have won many races with other cars. This car in May will be competing with 140 other universities on a NASCAR racetrack. It doesn't get more exciting than that. But it does, because the rocket, if you notice the rocket, those students will be launching that rocket in June competing with 125 universities uh, in competition, and our students do so well in all the competitions uh, they participate in. And the autonomous car. Those of us who are getting a little long in the tooth can't wait for the autonomous car because we will be driving for decades longer than we ordinarily would. So it is all very, very exciting. Our faculty are absolutely committed to our students and the education of our students, and they are also deeply engaged in research. And so you will have the pleasure of seeing some or listening to some of our faculty present a kind of snapshot of the research projects that they're working on. And to get to introduce and open up this event, we have a video that represents some of our faculty and their research. So if we could see the video. At Ford, we have seen a lot of technological and societal changes that are shaping the future of our industry. And as we evaluate how these changes will impact our company, we know that leveraging external partnerships with world-class universities like U of M Dearborn will be crucial to creating smart vehicles in a smart world. In our study that we just wrapped up, we were looking at head impacts and head acceleration in boys and girls high school across. We used a wearable device to measure the number of head impacts and the linear and angular head acceleration. I think it's important in the classroom to be able to give kind of some practical examples. 
my students had to learn about human subjects research. What are the rules? How do we do that correctly? How do we problem solve on the field when devices fail and things like that? In all of those different phases, I have students that are involved. Well, the Urban Practice Workshop is intended as a place to experiment with community-driven research, focused at this point on transitions in low-income housing markets after the financial crisis. And with the kinds of information that we've collected over time, allow us to build a more robust understanding of how those things are operating in the city. The experience that I hope undergraduates gain in the workshop are the belief or the idea that they have the power to make change. The other great part is they acquire a number of skills that they can use as they look for employment, go on to grad school, whatever it is they choose to do. Conducting research here at the university has offered me a lot of opportunities that I would have never had before and inspiration for maybe new paths to travel. The conventional wisdom has been that small company stocks do better than large company stocks and we find our results are exactly the opposite. The implications are huge. You should build a large portfolio. In fact, the broadest portfolio of stocks that you can think of and just invest and just hold. I can't do any of my research if I don't have access to any of these data services. Support that we get from the university or college of business is, is better than any other university in the state of Michigan. My research is very much focused on obesity in older adults. The reason is that it's extremely prevalent, it's extremely disabling, and it's very costly. And there are things we can do, and specifically we can focus on obese individuals with other chronic conditions, in particular mental chronic conditions. We have a chance to reduce both the prevalence and the consequences of obesity in older adults. I would be hard pressed to say where's the boundary between my research and my teaching. My teaching is very much informed by my research. That for me is priceless. I think the university has invested a lot of money in building infrastructure which facilitates not only the research which is done by professors like me but it also aids in classroom learning. Conducting research at University of Michigan Dearborn really helps our students pick up valuable skills as well as exposes them to research in general and the possibility of either doing that as a career or furthering their education. When I look for collaborators, I don't have to look far. We know each other, we know what we are doing, we support each other, and it's very easy to collaborate. UM Dearborn absolutely provides me the freedom to do my research, answer my research questions. Okay. Well, after that inspiring video, it is with great pride that we provide as an overture to this day-long event, uh, brief research presentations by nine U of M Dearborn faculty, which I suppose that makes that a nonet, uh, a dectet, if you include the chancellor who will speak last. <laughs> Uh, which I hope will give you a sense of the wide and rich range spectrum of, of research endeavors here at U of M Dearborn. And now, without further ado, our first presenter, Dr. Carmel Price. She's an assistant professor of sociology um, and has earned degrees from the University of North Carolina, Tulane University, and the University of Tennessee. Her work is found in scholarly journals focused on community and policy-based applications of research, such as the Journal of Community Practice, Analysis of Social Issues and Public Policy, and Population Research and Policy Review. She is the co-founder of the College and University Panthers uh, research team on campus. Dr. Price also uh, lifts up the work of students. In her five years on the faculty at U of M Dearborn, Dr. Price has published in peer-reviewed journals with four undergraduate students and has employed 12 undergraduate research assistants. Uh, Dr. Price's presentation is titled, Let's Feed Students with Knowledge and Bread.
other way. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story about two students, student A and student B. They both go to the same university, they both have the same major, they both have the exact same GPA. But student A comes from an upper middle class background and participates in unpaid research opportunities and unpaid internship programs. Student B, however, can't afford to do unpaid work, so they do paid labor off campus. Um, and um, they come from a working class, lower class background. So upon graduation, student A and student B don't have the same outcomes because they don't have the same resume. So college, which is supposed to be this great equalizer, actually exacerbates inequality. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about student B. Student B is likely to come from a first generation college student, is likely to identify as a racial or ethnic minority group, and is likely to be um, um, identify as an LGBTQ student. Student B is also at high risk of being food insecure or homeless while enrolled in college. The latest research suggests that 30 to 50 percent of college students are food insecure while uh, enrolled in college. As a result, food pantries all across the country have emerged um, uh, on college campuses. So then this really begs the question, the research question, to what extent are food pantries on college and university campuses leveling the playing field between student A and student B? To help answer this question, I co-founded the College and University Pantries CUP research team here at the University of Michigan Dearborn. And when Dr. Uh, Sampson and I first began this research in 2014, there were 140 campus pantries operating in the United States. Today in 2019, there are over 700 campus pantries in operation. And when we uh, first started, our very first research project that we did was actually capturing the stories of campus pantry directors and uh, students who were using the pantry. And we heard stories from students who were telling us things like that on the weekends, they encouraged their children to sleep late so that they could feed them two meals a day instead of three. And so today, the CUP research team is actually engaged in a plethora of activities. We're doing mixed methods research where we're really trying to unpack this research question. To what extent are pantries leveling this playing field and creating equality between students A and student B? We're engaged in a longitudinal research project across multiple campuses uh, in Michigan. We're tracking out comes across five years, like GPA, retention rates, um, and, uh, and health outcomes, mental and physical health. We're engaged in campus and community conversations, and we're using our research to help create evidence-based policies. We're engaged with legislators like uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow and Congressman Andy Levin. In sum, I'd like to modify the words of John Muir, who famously said, everyone needs beauty as well as bread. I like to say everyone needs books as well as bread, and students shouldn't have to choose. Thank you. Our next presenter is Dr. Aaron Ahuvia, a somewhat unusual marketing professor whose research includes a focus on peace, love, and happiness. Really. <laughs> he is regarded as the world's leading authority uh, on the psychology of a certain type of love, namely the love people have for objects or activities. A published study ranked him amongst the world's 25 most influential researchers studying consumption. 
He is quoted in Time, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and has appeared on national public radio, talk shows, as well as the Oprah Winfrey show. I'm dying to ask him whether that was the show where they handed out cars. <laughs> Dr. Ahuvia's talk is titled, The Paradox of Non-Interpersonal Love. People tell me that they love all kinds of different things. Uh, they may love their home, as we see here. They love to fly. Uh, this gentleman loves his car so much he's taking it on a dinner date. <laughs> However, other people tell me they don't think any of this is really love. In their view, you can only truly, authentically love another person. Well, it turns out that these skeptics are, in a sense, right. But it also turns out that all the people who tell me about loving their car, loving their cell phone, those people are right too. So how can they both be right at the same time? The earliest animals, the prehistoric fish, did not have very much of a love life. The way that they would reproduce, the female lays a lot of eggs, the male fertilizes them, and they both swim off, their parenting duties done for the rest of their year, I guess. Uh, some appeal to that process. <laughs> Later animals, however, would develop a different reproductive strategy. They have far fewer offspring, but they start to evolve brain mechanisms that get them to, in a sense, love their offspring. They feed their children, they protect their children, they take care of their children and sometimes their mate in ways that don't make sense always for them as an individual for the short term, but makes sense because their children carry on their genes to the next generation. Later still, primates, and especially humans, are able to expand this not just to the animals that have our same genes, but to friends. And that makes sense because if you're my friend, you know that I will help you, but I know that you will help me. So we've got this bilateral relationship. None of that makes sense for loving your cell phone. Your cell phone is not going to carry on your genes like your children do, and it doesn't matter how affectionate you feel towards your cell phone, that's not going to change its behavior towards you. So none of this really makes sense. Furthermore, our brain is very, very good at automatically sorting things into two piles. It sorts objects into the object sort of group and people into the people group, and it thinks about these things quite differently your brain is able to make this distinction, and the objects we think about through, quote, objectifying them, right? We treat them like objects, which means we don't have a lot of emotional connection to them. We don't care about them in that way. How is it then the case that we love objects? Well, we love objects and activities because we start thinking about them as if they were people. And there's three ways this happens. The first is anthropomorphization. So if the object looks like a person or sounds like a person, we think about it in some ways as if it was a person. Second, some objects we symbolically attach to another person, like my wedding ring. I think of it in my connection to my wife. And so I love her, and it takes part in some of that love. The third are objects or activities that become part of our own identity. We're people, and if we see the object or the activity as something that makes us who we are, it becomes attached to us, and we think about it as if, in a certain sense, it was a person as a result of that. So the paradox of non-interpersonal love is that people, in a sense, can only genuinely love other people, However, we love a lot of objects and activities because our brains, at a non-conscious level, are applying some of the same psychological mechanisms that we use when we think about people, also applying these to these objects. Our next presenter is Dr. Mitch Sollenberger. Uh, professor of Political Science and Associate Provost for Undergraduate Education and Student Success. He has written three books on presidential power and politics, 
uh, with his articles appearing in the Presidential Studies Quarterly, Political Science and Politics, Congress and the Presidency, Public Administration Quarterly, and other journals. He has written op-eds in the USA Today, Washington Post, Roll Call, Politico, and CNN, with his most recent appearing in the New York Daily News on the subject of independent counsel Robert Mueller's report and executive privilege. His presentation is titled, Presidential Power in the Age of Trump. Mitch. Good morning. So as you can see, my research primarily centers around presidential power and behavior, particularly its usage as a general unifying concept. Recently, I'm trying to finish up a book-length manuscript that looks at the unitary executive theory. Uh, that has been the controlling model of presidential behavior dating back to at least Ronald Reagan's administration. So what is the unitary executive theory? It really comes down to two basic aspects of power, its degree and its scope. Its degree in that the unitary executive has claimed that presidents have absolute control over all executive-based powers derived from the Constitution, along with all statutorily created ones as well. This power combination is inherent in the position of the presidency itself, which means that the other branches can't check the president's power. This is informative when it comes to relationship between the presidency and Congress, because what it does is it eliminates the very concept of checks and balances. It unmoors the presidency from the Constitution, laws, and any normative cultural constraints on presidential power. Now, its scope comes into play in that the advocates of unitary executive theory believe that the president has absolute control over all decisions made in the executive branch, whether that's in a White House, ex um, the departments, agencies, commissions. My research largely counsels against this as being a useful model for understanding presidential theory. Is what I've done is I marshaled a substantial amount of empirical evidence that shows that presidents are not absolute in carrying out and executing executive powers. So how has my research helped inform the debate over presidential power? Uh, let me just cite one example, highlight executive privilege. An executive privilege is the ability of presidents to refuse to disclose information and testimony to Congress, the courts, and the public. During George W. Bush's administration, President Brush, Bush claimed executive uh, privilege against a uh, congressional investigation that was looking at his firings of U.S. attorneys. This controversy went all the way to the District of Columbia District Court where a federal judge ruled against President Bush's claim of executive privilege. In that case, the federal judge cited a Mikai brief that I had uh, written saying that it helped inform his decision and really inform his basic understanding of the contours of executive privilege. So in that case, the federal judge held that President Bush's claim was overly broad in that he couldn't protect information coming from the Department of Justice. So, how does something that happened now nearly 15 years ago inform our understanding of the presidency under President Trump? Well, there's two controversies going on right now. One you might have heard about, I don't know, the Mueller investigation into the Russian collusions, uh, which has produced a report. And the other one is less well known, it's the White House security clearance process. This is an interbranch conflict between the House and the White House. It's dealing with the misuse and abuse of uh, that process when it comes to giving people security clearances. In both cases, uh, a claim of executive privilege by President Trump would likely be partially or completely struck down. In the case of the Independent Counsel's report, if President Trump does claim executive privilege, the same analysis that I used for George W. Bush and his claims of executive privilege would hold there, in that he's claiming executive privilege over information that's derived from the Department of Justice. It's just too overly broad. The second, the White House security clearance process, even though presidents have a deliberative process where they have protection over their immediate staff and are able to seek counsel and advice, secure from having that information released, that can be overcome with a showing of abuse, 
coming from whatever action is happening. And the abuse and misuse, at least the allegations are, of the White House security uh, clearance process serious enough where I think an executive privilege claim would be overcome by the congressional investigation. So thank you very much. From political science to engineering, our next presenter is Dr. Deliane Tolbert, an assistant professor of industrial and manufacturing systems engineering. In 2017, she was honored as the outstanding alumna of the year by the Detroit area pre-college engineering program. She interweaves her passion for educational success for all through her research investigations community involvement, and service to the academic community. Currently, Deliane is designing a research agenda to investigate the relationship between the two research worlds she dances in, design thinking, creativity on the one hand, and access to engineering in historically underrepresented and underserved communities. She hopes to leverage her faculty position to serve as a bridge builder between the surrounding community and the collegiate engineering classroom through research and engagement. Dr. Tolbert's talk is titled, Know Their Story, Engineer Their Success. Okay, so we had an inside joke about dancing. We won't be doing that today. But, <laughs> but I do dance between these two worlds. The one I'll talk about today is what I'll share. Um, no, that's not the one I'll share. This one is. <laughs> so I want to understand a couple of things. The, but the most primary um, aspect of my research has to do with our students. Who are they? What communities do they come from? What experiences are they drawing upon when they um, solve engineering problems, when they're working in teams, when they're applying for jobs? And as a student here at University of Michigan-Dearborn, I felt that the College of Engineering and Computer Science knew that I was here because I applied. They could look at, they had uh, data on where I came from. But I didn't think that I was known. I didn't feel known and supported in some ways. In many ways, I did. And this is not a story that's new to our campus. This is when you have underrepresented students at predominantly white institutions, this is an experience that many students have across our nation. And so as we're looking at my experience, but um, primarily the experiences of students like me across our nation, this leads me to a few questions. Here's what we do know. African-Americans, Latino, Spanish-speaking communities, and, under, and women are underrepresented in engineering. We also know that the neighborhoods that our students come from influences their upward mobility. We know that across the nation, we are facing a sharp decline in high school graduation rates. And finally, we know that the geographic proximity of institutions like ours to urban centers provides vast opportunities to impact students. So how do we use, given that we know those things, how do we begin to leverage the data that we have to make decisions that affect the students, not just getting them into the door, but supporting them while they're here, and even before they get to our universities, use strategies, well-calculated strategies to support the communities they're coming from so that we can create more pathways to engineering. My solution is I have two approaches. Um, it's a mixed method study. The first is to use big data. So this is just data is all around us. We know in engineering that there are lots of sources of data. We have cameras collecting data. We have cell phones. We recently heard that Google is listening to our conversations. Well, everyone's listening to our conversations, right? So what do we do with this data that we're collecting? <laughs> At, here on universities like ours, we have offices of, like institutional research, where we know the addresses, the socioeconomic status, the GPA, fam we know this information about our students. Broadly, in the United States, we have census data. Census data gives us critical insights into communities. In a recent study led by economist Raj Chetty, he found that in the US, excuse me, he found that the neighborhoods confirmed that neighborhoods impact upward mobility. The second part of my study is, looking, is interviewing. So if we know 
that the neighborhoods that our students come from impact the com their ability to succeed, um, have access to jobs, careers, including access to college, how do they apply to college? How would they, if the student, if a community does not have access to either jobs or internet, for example, in Detroit, about 40% of families do not have access to internet, then how can we use big data and interviews to strategize and create um, a pro more pathways into engineering? I offer four ideas. First, identify the communities that our students represent, the markers of those communities, and the pathways that already exist into our college. Second, interview representative students to understand their stories, to make connections between the big data and, and the actual people in the college, get to know the student. Finally, develop strategies that inform the decisions that we make to address policy, to address recruitment, to request, even to address strategies for how do we support students here enrolled in the university. I think that this type of study that I'm doing can help us know our students and engineer their success. Thank you. We're veering into the world of mathematics with our next presenter, Dr. Yunus Zetunchu, an associate professor of mathematics. Dr. Zetunchu earned his PhD from the Ohio State University um, and worked at Texas A&M before joining U of M Dearborn. In addition to being a productive researcher with a long list of publications, Dr. Zetunchu is known for his interest and ability in communicating mathematics to a, wild, to a wide range of audiences, <laughs> and wild as well. I'll get this right in the next rehearsal. <laughs> he works with middle and, and high school students at math circles every summer. He mentors a cohort of undergraduate uh, research students from all around the country. He had a Harvard student last year. He organizes uh, workshops for graduate students and junior faculty members. And today, he is joining us after returning from a week-long research visit in Palo Alto, uh, California. Dr. Zitunchu's presentation is titled, Solving Differential Equations in, in Different Geometries. Good morning, everyone. Has anyone had coffee this morning? Yes. Can I see some hands? Did you put any cream in it? Yes. OK, anyone had black? All right, so when you put cream into your coffee, did you watch it? Did you stir it right away? Yeah, I stirred it. OK, has anyone done that? When you have a cup of coffee, especially in a glass mug, and you pour some cream, and you take your time, and you marvel at it, you see how the cream moves? Has anyone done that? <laughs> All right. And if you have done it, you should know that that's an amazing process. And you should also, I should also tell you now that that's a very difficult process to model. So at that split second, every time you pour coffee, one split second later, you will see something new. There's a very high probability that that was something different than what you've seen the morning before. So this is not unique to coffee. It is true for any kind of fluids moving in one another. If you have cream and coffee, cream will move in coffee, but you will, you will not know exactly what shape and what time it will reach at a specific point. So if you take a small part of your coffee mug, and if you look at the density of cream there, if you want to precisely calculate the amount of cream at a very specific time, you have to solve a, different, a very difficult set of differential equations. As you can imagine, this set of differential equations will be quite complicated because let's think about it. You have cream and coffee. Do you think that process would change if the cream was cold or the coffee was cold or hot? So it depends on the temperature of the coffee and the cream. Do you think the process would differ if the uh, coffee mug was tall or it was wide? Would it change? It would. And this is, again, nothing uh, uh, unique to coffee and cream. Anytime you have two objects moving one in another, you will see some very amazing 
configurations if you zoom in and if you do slow motion. Of course, when you have your coffee and cream and if you stir it, it will be homogeneous very quickly. But we are talking about split seconds at a nanoscale. If you want to do this calculation, it will take quite a bit of effort to do that. And this is, again, nothing unique to coffee and uh, cream or two different inks, two different dyes. This is very common in other fields, too. We heard from our engineering colleagues, when you model your airplane wings moving in air or you model, you design a new car and you look at the side mirrors, your plastic will move in air. So you have to understand how the plastic and the metal or the air interacts. And if you want to understand this interaction, you have to solve this. <laughs> Let me start with the good news. Good news is that people said, if you want to understand this process, you have to solve a differential equation. Everyone was so excited. Yes, <laughs> I will know where my cream is split seconds later. But you have to solve this differential equation. Has anyone, has anyone had differential equations before? Taken a differential equations course? How did you like it? <laughs> uh -huh. That's completely fine. That's the reaction was, uh, I was expecting. Do you remember any particular solution method? That's very normal, because if you remember your differential equation experience, or if you haven't had, don't worry, you will learn a long list of different methods to solve differential equations. Because we don't have a single method that will solve all differential equations. So the way it works, you have a differential equation, you scratch your head and you say, let me try this. It may, may not work, then you try something else. And what we teach in differential equations, different methods. Now we have a differential equation, it's called Navier-Stokes equation, and this is the equation that we know will help us to model a fluid moving in another fluid. But right now, the whole humanity, the set of all mathematicians, we don't know how to solve this differential equation in the most generality, even we don't know if there's a solution. And it's a million dollar problem. And as a research mathematician, what I do as a pure mathematician, my job is to understand different structures to create different frameworks to help people to solve differential equations. With my collaborators, we especially look at the interaction between differential equations and geometry, and we try to help other applied mathematicians and engineers to solve differential equations and create better models. And I want to conclude with this. This is, again, not just about cream and coffee. Has anyone uh, heard about Uber? Are they uh, public already? Probably they haven't gone public already. And we heard our finance professors are working on this too. So this differential equation modeling is also applicable in many other fields, like how Uber will move inside this stock market. Again, we have to solve differential equations. Thank you. Dr. Stein Brandvand will take the podium next. He's an Associate Professor of Educational Technology and Associate Dean in the College of Education, Health, and Human Services. His research focuses on the enhancement of learning environments through the integration of technology, and he has published articles in the International Journal of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, the Journal of Research on Technology in Education, Contemporary Issues in Technology and Teacher Education and Other Journals. He has also written several book chapters on topics ranging from facilitating collaboration in MOOCs uh, to the integration of e-portfolios in higher education. Dr. Bronvan's presentation is titled, Harnessing the Power of Technology to Meet the Needs of All. Thank you. Um, so I don't drink coffee, which is my excuse for not understanding most of that last presentation. Um, but I'm sure it was crystal clear to all of you. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a couple of M-cubed projects I've been working on with my colleagues. And I want to emphasize working out with my colleagues, because uh, even though I'm painfully aware that I'm up here all by myself talking to, almost all by myself, talking to you, um, the work I'm going to tell you about is definitely the result of a collaborative team effort. Um, so the first project is called Coding Instruction for All. And the purpose behind this project was to create a series of learning activities and lessons for middle school students with disabilities 
to help introduce them to coding and basic app development. And the reason why we wanted to focus on this particular population of learners is because uh, in all of the work that's been done around STEM and the infusion of STEM and education at all levels, students with disabilities have often been left out of that discussion. Uh, the assumption that they, they wouldn't be able to, to learn how to code or to uh, work in these different um, types of environments in, in computer software. Uh, and so in an attempt to try to, in a small way, fill that void, we wanted to create some curriculum and lessons that could be used to work with students with disabilities. So we hired a group of undergraduate research assistants from mathematics, computer science, uh, and special education. We put them together in uh, cross-disciplinary teams so they could work uh, collaboratively in an iterative process of design to create a variety of different learning activities. And then we were able to work with a middle school uh, special education teacher in Detroit Public Schools uh, to pilot those lessons. And we took some pre and, uh, pre and post day, uh, test data was collected in the, an attempt to look at the impact um, working through those lessons had on the student's ability to engage in critical thinking. Um, we're currently looking at that data and analyzing it to see what we can learn from it and also working further with the teacher to see what other revisions need to be made to the lessons before we look to pilot them in uh, future classrooms. The other project is fairly new. It was just recently funded, so we're still in the planning development stages of this. Uh, and in this project, we're looking to utilize virtual reality, or VR, to help students, again, students with disabilities, develop life transition skills. And what we mean by life transition skills are those skills that any individual needs to operate as independently as possible within their own communities. So it could be things such as going to the grocery store and buying groceries, checking out at the cash register, um, uh, riding on public transportation, going to a movie theater or other entertainment venues of that kind. So one way for a teacher to do this is to take students into those environments, right? Um, take a group of students into a grocery store. I'm guessing we've all uh, had the luxury of experiencing the chaos of Myers or Kroger's or pick your grocery store of choice. Uh, in those environments, a teacher can't control how much noise, light, how many people are there, right? And so if a student gets overwhelmed by that, the only uh, option really is just to remove the student from that environment and thus end the learning experience. It's also difficult if a student needs several opportunities to practice those skills, going back to the grocery store over and over and over again is not very feasible. So we're looking at using virtual reality, developing some scenarios where students can put on these headsets, we use a 360 degree camera, go out into these environments, capture footage, produce scenarios, so that they can immerse themselves in these different environments, practice the skills they need to be successful. If it gets overwhelming, just take off the headset, you remove yourself from the environment, uh, if you need to practice 10, 15 times over and over again, you can do that. Uh, and what we're hoping to see is what impact this will have on uh, students' ability then to go out in real environments and, and navigate those social situations. The goals of both projects are really the same, developing learning activities uh, and opportunities for students with disabilities to be able to develop not only academically, but social skills that they need to be successful out in the world and to share these resources out with teachers at a low or hopefully no cost. Thank you. Pressing on with Dr. Jung Hyung Jesse Lee, an assistant professor of organizational behavior and human resource management at the College of Business. She has published 11 journal articles in leading management journals and is the recipient of the SAGE Best Paper Award from the Midwest Academy of Management in 2017. She was also nominated as the College of Business Researcher of 2018. Dr. Lee's presentation is titled, Five Ways to Build Thriving Workplaces. Good morning, everyone. Have we ever experienced rude or offensive remarks from your colleagues or supervisors? If so, did it negatively affect your feelings and performance? I see many of you are nodding your heads. Evidence from 
neuroscience and psychology suggest negative events affect us more than positive ones. Related studies in this field also indicate that one bad interaction takes at least five positive actions to repair the damage. A lot of us spend more time on a daily basis working with the people in the organization than you, our own families. For these reasons, it is critical for organizations to minimize negative events to build a workplace where individuals can thrive. I have studied various types of negative work experiences, such as incivility, abusive supervision, gender or sexual harassment, restrictive criticism, and organizations failing to deliver their promises and obligations to employees. These aversive situations have a detrimental effect on individuals' well-being and productivity. For example, one of the studies that I've been involved, college students who experienced uncivil remarks from staffs and instructors reported greater psychological distress and reduced occupational aspirations. With the goal of understanding and identifying deterring factors of negative events, in my research, I often focus on managers because managers set the tone for the appropriate behavior in the workplace, acting as a key role model. Some of the research that I found to build a, a thriving workplace, organizations can benefit from using leaders, managers, using active and constructive, constructive leadership. So I found that when employees work under a manager who shows concerns for employees and clarify expectations of the appropriate behavior, they feel valued and treated fairly. For those feelings of fairness, they are less likely to engage in uncivil acts. In contrast, when employees work under penalty-oriented and hands-off leadership, they are more likely to engage in harassing behaviors towards others, which leads to a toxic work environment. Similarly, by encouraging employee managers to to use their uh, active and ethical leadership, organizations can cultivate norms for mutual respect. And also, it will be important for organizations to align managers' interest with their organization's interest. Do you want to run a thriving business? Or do you want to work in a thriving workplace? I hope these five points help you get there. Thank you. Back to engineering with Dr. Alex Yasha Yi, a professor and doctoral program director at the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and faculty affiliate at the Energy Institute in the Ann Arbor campus. His research focuses on integrated electronics and photonics with applications in renewable energy, microsensing, and artificial intelligence. He has authored more than 100 top journal papers, edited a book, written three book chapters, and holds 13 US patents and an international one. He has led many government and industry funded projects, served at review panels for NSF, Department of, Edu of uh, Energy and Department of Defense. Dr. E has served, uh, has received an MIT Presidential Fellowship, MIT Rosenblith Fellowship, and the U of M Dearborn Distinguished Research Award. He is currently serving 
as editorial board member for Scientific Reports, a nature research journal, editorial board member for Journal of Material Science, Materials in Electronics, and is a senior member of both IEEE and OSA. I hope there are no questions for me on what those are. <laughs> Dr. E's presentation is titled Integrated Nano Optoelectronics Laboratory. Uh, good morning. So uh, I think, uh, you know, today I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, uh, of course, the uh, integrated nano optic electronics laboratory. But uh, the main thing I want to talk about is the uh, small is big. So basically, you know, what we are doing, my lab is doing is to put my, many tiny transistors or devices on a single chip, like, uh, you know, fingernail. So uh, one of my question is, uh, do you know what's the size of the transistor we are currently using on the integrated chip right now? For example, you know, smartphone, laptop, anyone has an answer? So it's, a, it's a basically only 14 nanometer. So it's, it's very small. So our research is basically focused on the integrate the tiny devices on a single chip to achieve many applications, including the renewable energy, uh, you know, like uh, photovoltaic cell, solar cell, and also the uh, solid state lighting, and also uh, for the biomedicine, uh, photonic sensors, and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So if you look at this, uh, you know, all the applications we have and all the electronic devices we have, basically this all made possible by the integration of the billions of transistors on the uh, single chip. So uh, one thing uh, I want to mention is, uh, you know, uh, since the invention of the first transistor, uh, do you know what's the size of the first transistor back in 1956? It's about this big. So it's about, you know, half, me half meter. If you think about, if we cannot shrink this big size to the nanometer size, which is, uh, you know, 10 to the minus 9 meter, if we still integrate the billions of this, uh, you know, first age transistor and uh, try to make it perform the f uh, functionality of our current phone, what do we expect the size of the current uh, the phone size? You have an idea? So I did estimate. So the size is going to be, you know, from the Earth to the moon. So now we are holding the device just with our, you know, palm size. So that's, you know, basically, you know, that's, you know, caused by the tremendous, you know, capability of we can shrink the size to a nanometer scale size and we can, you know, integrate and uh, perform the uh, multiple functionality. So if you look at that, one thing is very interesting if you uh, compare, you know, uh, the uh, uh, size of the virus. The virus is about 100 nanometer to 50 nanometer. Actually, our current transistor size is only 40 nanometer. In the future, it's going to be like a five nanometer. So it's a much, much smaller than virus size. So that's the, one of the reasons the integrated electronics and the photonics can be even applied to the future biomedical field. So this is a really, you know, uh, uh, you know, caused by the, you know, transistor number per chip has increased from one back in 1956 all the way to the billions of transistors on a single chip. So uh, over the years, uh, you know, uh, for my research lab, we have uh, published uh, uh, many papers in top journals and also uh, awarded um, uh, millions of external grants. And uh, personally, I have uh, given uh, many invited talks and uh, uh, I have been issued 13 U.S. patents. One of the, patent, uh, one of the patents has uh, brought, uh, you know, almost 100 million uh, revenue for a 3M company. And uh, our research work has also been featured in many places like uh, uh, MIT News, uh, Science Daily, and uh, other places. So one thing I want to, uh, you know, emphasize is that we have a worldwide collaborations. So my PhD students go to uh, a number of Lurie nanofabrication to do the device fabrication uh, a lot. And uh, we have a close collaboration with the MIT uh, Microsystem Technology Lab. And internationally, uh, we have a wide uh, uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Beijing University uh, in uh, uh, Asia and also 
uh, a few universities in uh, East Europe, uh, in the European Uni Union. So uh, one thing I want to point out is the research is helping my teaching a lot. So the setup of the integrated nanoelectronics and the photonics laboratory, uh, you know, is basically enable our Dearborn campus to have the fundamental capability to fabricate nanoscale devices and, uh, on the chip. And also, for the first time, our students in our Dearborn campus can have the access to the state-of-the-art uh, nanofabrication, simulation, and the measurement capability. Thank you very much. Preceding Chancellor Grasso's closing address, our last faculty uh, research presentation will be by Dr. Jessica Camp, an assistant professor of social work in the Health and Human Services Department. Her research has been deeply impacted by nearly a decade of experience providing adult, adult mental health and substance use counseling in the community mental health system in Wayne County. She examines ways that economic inequality and labor market exclusion by race, gender, and disability can be challenged through, cha through changing federal policy and community systems. Her presentation is titled, Building Connections to Opportunity. So I don't think I'd be surprising anyone if I mentioned that there's a large disparity in wages in this country by gender. But what you may not know is that this disparity can be further compounded by other inequalities. For example, disability, specifically disability type. In this chart behind me, the purple line represents disparities for individuals who don't have any disabilities. But the multicolored lines beneath that show various disability types and the additional disparities that exist. This remains true when we look at race. So what are the factors that are continuing to contribute to this level of disparity? Well, we have the usual culprits, right? Discrimination, stigma, myths about workers that have disabilities and their productivity in the work environment. We have policies that fail individuals with disabilities, such as that certain employers are still allowed to pay sub-minimum wages. Further on, we also have disconnection from opportunity. Researchers such as myself are increasingly beginning to believe that trauma creates disconnection from services. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation found that one traumatic experience in childhood equated to being four times more likely to be chronically absent from school, 15 days or more. This leads to huge disparities in reading, writing, and math scores. This is increasingly concerning because in Metro Detroit, 19.4% of our youth are disconnected from work and school. And this is between the ages of 16 and 24, those crucial ages where connection to opportunity is so important. Additionally, these youth are three times more likely to have a disability, two times more likely to live in poverty, and 22 times more likely to have a run-in with the criminal justice system. So what are we gonna do about this? Trauma-informed care and restorative practices at the community level has the ability to impact connection for youth. By implementing this for older kids that are in high school, by implementing this in workforce reintegration, by implementing this in GED programs, and even colleges and universities, we can build connection to opportunity for youth, especially youth at risk of disconnection. This can give us the ability to challenge inequality, to make youth the beneficiaries of the economic and labor market growth that's occurring in Detroit. Thank you. Good morning, uh, I'm Domenico Grasso, 
And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to welcome you to this day's events. And I want to thank the students who did a tremendous job with the poster presentations and our faculty that did an outstanding job in these very brief demonstrations of some of the scholarship that happens at this university. It's exciting to be at a university. For those of you who work at, at a university and for those of you who attend universities, you know that this is where we can engage in so many exciting thoughts and ideas. And it is important for our faculty to be engaged in consequential research. And we saw that today, that we're addressing many areas that are very important to our society. And in, in the words of uh, Albert Einstein, you really uh, don't understand anything unless you can explain it to your grandmother. So I think that we saw here that our faculty really understand the topics that they are talking about because we were able to really engage with them. And I'm, I'm still waiting to understand what the solution to the Navier-Stokes equation is because when that was presented to me in multiple classes, I always struggled with that, but that was great to bring back all those horrors during this presentation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I do want to say that it is a clear demonstration of the passion that our faculty have, not only for their areas of scholarship, but for how they engage our students, because they bring that same passion and that same level of expertise into the classroom. And that's what makes the University of Michigan Dearborn uh, such a special place. I'm very, very proud to call all of our faculty members, colleagues, and to have such a great student body as is demonstrated out in the hallway. Um, I do, I, and I thought that I really enjoyed these brief uh, things that we did, these little TED Talk things, and uh, I think we should do this on a more frequent basis. I don't want to do, go through a whole inauguration to do this, but I do think that on a, on a frequent basis we should have these brief vignettes of research that's happening around campus because there are so many ideas in which we can connect with one another. I thank you all for being here. I want to uh, really stress the importance of our scholarship being a, a fundamental uh, and important cornerstone of what we do at the University of Michigan Dearborn. I hope to see all of you at the events in the Fieldhouse very soon this afternoon. And again, thanks for everything that everybody does for this university, for the state, and for our nation and the world. Go Blue!